Good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Wendy O'Sullivan. I am the National Park Service Superintendent for the Chesapeake Office. We are here today to provide an overview of the new grant offering from the Chesapeake Bay Gateways and Water Trails Network. And with me today, I'd like to introduce our team as we get started. Um, with me today is um, Bob Campbell, who is the head of the Chesapeake Gateways Planning and Development Program. Um, also with me is Eddie Gonzalez, who's the Director of Partnerships and Grants for Gateways, and two partners that are helping us with these network chats and sessions is the head of the National Park Service Stewardship Institute, Rebecca Stanfield McCowan. Say hello and wait. hello. Um, and also Brent Mitchell, who's with the QLF uh, Foundation. Hi there. All right. So today we are excited to walk through with everyone the new grant offering from Chesapeake Bay Gateways and Water Trails Network. But before we do that, we always start our gateway sessions with networking as a means to get to know each other, connect with old colleagues, meet new friends. So I'm going to ask Rebecca to frame the way we do this. Um, for those that are new, it'll be new to you. For those that have been with us before, I hope, um, I hope you enjoy this first portion. Thank you, Wendy. As Wendy said, we start most of our conversations with this opportunity for us to get acquainted with who else is in the meeting, who else is in the webinar and the call with us. It's one of the, the strategic pillars of the Chesapeake office is to really build this network. And that means taking time to connect and engage with each other. To do that, we're gonna break into quick networking triads. You'll be in a group with about two other people and we're asking you to share your name, your organization and your connection to the Chesapeake Gateways, your connection to the Chesapeake Watershed, sort of what brought you here. This is a great opportunity for you to see who else is doing some work in your general geography or the larger geography of the watershed and maybe connect with some old friends that you haven't seen or talked to in a while. Um, really just staying true to the value that partnership, collaboration and engagement is really core for our, the success of our work and that we want a strong network that has all of us working together. So Brent's going to break us into our triads. They're going to be pretty short. So this is a snappy introduction and just a quick, how do you do? Get to know each other. Um, and then we'll be back in and we'll be diving into the content of the webinar and really learning more about this grant opportunity. Are we ready, Brent? Yeah, here we go. Welcome back from your small triads. As the main room repopulates, happy to see everybody back here. Thank you all. Hopefully folks met some new people. I certainly did, which was great. Thank you, Ava, for um, being with us. Um, and we're glad to see um, so many folks engaged. And so we will um, get started with the main portion of today's session. So we will get the slides back up and get started. So because this is really a session where we're walking through the new Chesapeake Gateway grant offering and, and the um, announcement, there's gonna be a lot of presentation, but we, we want to share and encourage is that everyone who is joining us really utilize the chat feature and our team is going to be watching and and um, using the chat to answer questions as we go and then as we're going through the presentation we will take time to pause and open to talk together and answer questions together. So we'll both use the chat as we go and find those moments in time 
through the presentation to pause and and purposely ask for um, questions and as we go through this. So thank you all for being with us this afternoon. Again, I'm Wendy O'Sullivan, the superintendent for the National Park Service Chesapeake office. And what you see here is just a, a, a starter to sort of frame things. And that is to show the quote from our, what's called our enabling legislation for the Park Service called the Chesapeake Bay Initiative Act of 1998. And also, um, you know, so we're coming up on 25 years that we will be celebrating um, this coming year of our founding legislation for the MPS role with the Chesapeake. And then also really recent language from a, a recent executive order that, that helps frame what we will be talking through today. So next slide. But really, we always start here by sharing the map of the 40, 41 million acre Chesapeake watershed. So it is worth noting that the Chesapeake is the largest estuary in, in North America and that its watershed is so significant. It runs from upstate New York through Pennsylvania, through portions of Delaware and West Virginia, nearly all of Maryland and a huge portion of Virginia, and of course, all of DC. And that landscape is the scale and scope of where these grants can be deployed. It represents really the, you know, the, the quickest way to see where the MPS is focused out of the Chesapeake Gateways Network. We help support, run, track, manage um, these three partnerships that are shared here on the screen. We'll talk today about the Chesapeake Gateways Program, which is a partnership network and a community assistance program. But Chesapeake Gateways also works with and supports two other primary partnerships that we're involved in as the National Park Service. And the, the, the longest standing one and, and a, a very substantial one is the Chesapeake Bay Program, which is the federal multi-state partnership to restore and conserve the Chesapeake and the watershed. The EPA is the, is the lead federal agency for that. There's many federal agencies, as well as state agencies and nonprofit partners, university partners, community organizations that are part of the Chesapeake Bay program. And then the National Park Service also founded and co-convened another collaborative that's called the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership. We co-convene the um, Chesapeake Conservation Partnership with the Chesapeake Conservancy. It's a collection of agencies, land trusts, tribal partners, nonprofit partners that really form themselves as a large landscape collaborative and are striving to conserve 30% of the watershed by 2030. Next slide. And today we're here to talk through a new grant from the Chesapeake Gateways program. And for those that are new to the Chesapeake Gateways and Water Trails Network. The network is both a structure of partners um, and it's, and so a partnership network and it's a community assistance program that's focused on places, people, stories, equity and inclusion across the watershed. When we think about the network in, a, in its structure, it's really, um, three different levels that we work within. First is, um, if, you, if you look at this map, again, it's the wa full watershed and the individual blue dots are representative of what we call gateway sites. And those are existing parks and refuges, historic sites, museums, other places that tell a piece of what makes the Chesapeake special. We also work at a large landscape scale, like I mentioned with the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership. 
and at a Chesapeake landscape regional scale. So because the, the way we are trying to ground all of our work to center people and, in, and have community engagement in our work, it's important to work within the, the structures that people think of themselves. So people would in certain areas of the watershed would more regularly align with understanding that they live near or, or work and, and live near the upper James River versus the lower Susquehanna versus the Shenandoah Valley. And so the, the blue ovals are representing those sub um, regions within the watershed. And then a new area that we're working on is to begin to support and function at a community scale. So the yellow dots are just um, representative of what we would consider a Chesapeake gateway community. And those are places that might have multiple gateway sites that are serving as a um, as ambassadors and, a, and an entryway into connecting with the Chesapeake. Next slide. And so on that first slide, I mentioned that our enabling legislation is the Chesapeake Bay Initiative Act of 1998. And this is the authority that we are using to offer this new grant. And this is just a way to show you some of the language that is associated with that. We have very um, broad authorities, exciting opportunities because of the forward thinking um, group of individuals that, that set out this program uh, for the National Park Service. You know, this was a, a congressional effort that was done back in the in the 90s and it is still one of the most um, inclusive one of the most forward-thinking programs that I have seen in my career and and we're thrilled to build on over 20 years of success of this office in bringing forward innovative projects and and programs that are advancing access and and connections to the Chesapeake um, and so we all are grounded in this in this legislation that was passed um, so many years ago. Next slide. So I just wanted to also give a little overview of the program funding. So the NPS Chesapeake Gateways program receives, is authorized under that legislation that we were just showing to receive up to $3 million a year in annual appropriations. Over the last um, several years, we have reached up to that um, 3 million cap. And um, so within those programmatic dollars, we advance the work of the Chesapeake Gateways Network in three primary ways. Through technical assistance, which is in the form of um, expertise and um, technical support brought forward by National Park Service staff. We also advance the work through cooperative and interagency agreements where there's financial assistance that includes substantial involvement from the National Park Service. And then we, we also have this third and um, new box that we are adding to our program, which is to bring forward the Chesapeake Gateways Network grant. And that is financial assistance to carry out a public purpose, but which does not, um, would not include substantial involvement from the National Park Service the way our cooperative or interagency agreements do. So I will go to the next slide, please. And um, here I'm going to pass the slides off to Eddie Gonzalez to take it from here. And again, please use the chat for questions as Eddie gets into the nuts and bolts of the um, grant offering. And then we'll take time as we go to pause for questions as well. 
Thank you, Wendy. Uh, and hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm super pleased that we're able to offer up this uh, set of, of network grants uh, for as part of our office's uh, support for community assistance uh, to the watershed. Um, as Wendy mentioned, we have a lot to present. Uh, there's a lot that I'm going to be going through. Uh, yeah, just to let you know, this is uh, one aspect of uh, getting you familiar with the program, with the, the, the grants themselves. We do have a landing page that I'll reference that'll have a lot more information. And then the application itself uh, has a lot more detail in it. So this is very much a summary view to just uh, orient you to all the different pieces. And uh, But there's a lot of opportunities for you to get more detail uh, in this. Uh, in uh, the application process. I did wanna start with just an overview of some of the highlights uh, to go ahead and set the stage uh, and uh, make sure that these are, uh, this is an opportunity that matches up what you're thinking about. Uh, so to start, it is a $1 million program as Wendy mentioned on the, uh, the grant disbursement side. We are categorizing it into two levels, small grants, which are gonna be about 225,000 to 50,000 and then larger grants in the 51 to 150,000 level. 150,000 is the cap for any one application. Uh, we do, uh, we know that there's a lot of need out there that we're gonna be representing. Uh, and we know that a lot of folks would likely benefit from $150,000. Uh, you know, I do wanna highlight, we only have a million dollars. It seems like a lot, but at the $150,000 level, uh, it can go quick. So we uh, are hoping that folks are realistic in thinking about what their needs are uh, and know that it'll likely be a little less competitive at the lower level than the higher level. Uh, we do expect um, uh, you know, a decent set of uh, submissions, but um, you know, hopefully uh, we're able to match up our funding to what you have needs for. The proposals, we're looking for them to come into in two different categories, inclusive interpretive initiatives and resilient communities and landscapes. And I'll go over both of those in more detail. Uh, we are utilizing these grants to focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and community engagement. Uh, we're seeing ourselves at it as how we can be catalytic in these areas. Where can we identify areas that are worthy of investment and we're really looking to uh, the network to let us know where these opportunities exist. The other thing I wanna highlight uh, about the budget is that there is no match requirement. We're really focused on making this as accessible to uh, all, all manner of eligible entities uh, by not having a match requirement. So whatever budget you need to uh, uh, address the project is the budget that you'll be asking for uh, through the, the proposal process. Uh, we also want to highlight that there's a broad uh, list of eligible uh, entities, including the private sector. So from the traditional nonprofits, community organizations, universities, uh, municipalities, those are all still eligible, uh, but we're also adding the private sector to this uh, offering. Uh, we're not sure what that's going to look like, so we're excited to see what kind of proposals come in. And I'll show a, a, a list of the actual entities further down in the presentation. Uh, you know, it, it, I do want to highlight that all the projects must have a public purpose uh, to can be considered a, a grant opportunity, as Wendy mentioned. And they also have to occur in the Chesapeake watershed. Our funding is limited to the parameters of the watershed itself. Uh, and the last thing to emphasize is that uh, because this is the first time we've gone back out to the network with such a wide reaching opportunity, we wanna have a pretty extensive application period to make sure that you all can get familiar with the application process, gather your uh, ideas together, you know, potentially gather any coalitions you might want to support your proposal. So we have a deadline of January 30th to allow that uh, extended uh, time period for you to get your planning together. Next slide, please. So what got us here? We had two uh, strategic planning processes that really helped frame where we're going with the uh, network grants. The first was a framework to look at the potential for impact in the Chesapeake Gateways network. Uh, so that paints a nice 15 to 20 year picture of what is on the horizon for us as an office and as an agency that helps support the watershed. From that, it was distilled down to a five year uh, a strategic plan and a lot of uh, partners uh, provided input to this 
So between both documents, they really help paint the picture of where we want to go, where we think there's opportunity for investments, uh, and hopefully help uh, can help guide you on developing some of your uh, project ideas. Next slide, please. Within the strategic plan, there are four uh, strategic themes that are listed. This grant program is gonna focus on two of them, as I mentioned in the highlight slide. The first is advancing a major inclusive interpretive initiative with an equity lens. And the second is promoting resilient communities and landscapes um, through tourism, sustainability, conservation, and local economies. You know, the reality is with more than 18 people living in the watershed, uh, our ability to support actions at the regional, local, and individual level are really what's going to create impact for the Bay, its rivers, our local climate, the landscapes, and the communities that are involved. These kinds of impacts really do contribute towards ecological health, human health, economic vigor, equity and access, and quality of life. It really allows uh, momentum around each of these areas. So we're seeking uh, ideas for how we can advance these within the network. These grants are focused on equity, inclusion, accessibility and engagement, but we're looking for you to let us know what that looks like locally. Next slide, please. The first one to explain a little bit uh, in more detail is advancing a major interpretive initiative with an equity lens. You know, the gateways really is a collection of narratives uh, across uh, a wide landscape. Uh, the watershed is rich in heritage, it's rich in history, it's rich in no, uh, natural assets, and it's rich in uh, the diversity of people that live there and utilize it every single day. Uh, we're looking at everything from pre-colonial history to things that are happening uh, today uh, and things that will be happening tomorrow and into the future. All of those things represent the landscape of uh, what is being told and what is not being told. So through these grants, we hope to engage underrepresented places, help tell underrepresented uh, stories, really facilitate galvanizing conservation and quality of life messaging, and strengthening the ladder of engagement for folks within the watershed. Next slide. To help kind of uh, uh, organize your thoughts on what this might look like at the local level, we have some sample actions that uh, support this strategic theme. So ideas that help develop meaningful relationships and advance engagement with underrepresented places and communities, uh, uh, projects that assess and more fully understand the diversity of communities that exist within the watershed and their needs. How can we better support them through interpretation, education, messaging, and engagement initiatives? Uh, linking culture and nature, how do all these things connect to each other, uh, and how do the communities within the watershed make those connections uh, or can be encouraged to establish some of those connections for their own benefit. Uh, and finally, uh, the ability to build ladders of youth engagement uh, at the community level, everything from programming to career development to workforce development. Now, this isn't a complete list. It's not meant to be a checklist where you know everyone's going to go back and do one of these four. This is just to kind of give you a sense of the types of projects we might be uh, looking for within this strategic theme. Next slide, please. On the, oh, actually, sorry, I meant to mention, so the, in summary for the other one, it, for me, it's really about what stories are being told, what stories are not being told, who's telling those stories, and really who is not telling those stories. So hopefully that'll give you a nice uh, kind of philosophical view of, of that strategic theme. Next slide. On the promoting resilient communities and landscapes, this is a much broader uh, definition on resilience than what you would typically see with the reference to either climate resilience or uh, uh, environmental resilience. We're really looking at the resilience of communities uh, that would also include their ability to uh, accommodate uh, issues that are coming up with climate change or just with local uh, environmental factors that they may have to deal with. Uh, but it's also broader than that. Uh, we know that you know, there's communities that depend on the watershed for their livelihood. Uh, we know there's communities out there that are actively conserving different parts of the watershed. Uh, we know that there are parts of the watershed that are still functioning in the way they've been functioning for uh, centuries, farming, fishing, 
uh, the heritage that uh, is captured within the landscapes and really all the natural assets that exist. So through these grants, we're looking to promote and market the Chesapeake watershed experience and what that looks like. We're looking to promote a stewardship ethic, not just for the communities within, but to the visitors that come to the watershed. We're also looking to facilitate collaboration and landscape of uh, community conservation efforts. How do all these things connect at the community level? Also advancing equitable access to the outdoors. Uh, there's many cases across the watershed where uh, access is becoming more and more limited and how can we help uh, counter that trend? And then also growing the landscape for heritage-based sustainable economies. There's a, a, a wide range of assets at the community level from cultural to natural to historical and how can communities better uh, market and capitalize on those assets is something that we hope to see. Next slide, please. Again, not meant to be a checklist, but just some sample activities and actions that uh, would fall within the strategic theme. Uh, and this is really to uh, capitalize on that community component and the people component, but making public lands and open spaces more welcoming and accessible. It's not a, if they, we build it, they will come. It's really a, if we build it, we need to uh, invite people to come. Uh, advancing watershed-wide land conservation and public access. So where is there opportunity for collaboration? Linking uh, nature-based and cultural tourism of the gateways, uh, really connecting the dots between those assets and the ability to get more people uh, into those areas to drive economic uh, 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 productivity, really to get more dollars flowing into the communities for local support. Uh, and then our ability to connect with underrepresented communities. Again, the communities know what they have needs for, so we're hoping that gets captured in the proposals that we'll be seeing when folks let us know what to invest in. Uh, and then deploying uh, programs that engage new audiences uh, and bringing new uh, people into the watershed through stories and, and visitorship. Next slide, please. So Eddie, before oh, we move on to the next section, um, a couple of questions. One, in terms of the categories, can folks apply under both categories or do they need to pick one category? You can apply to both. Uh, the only caveat is it's $150,000 max limit. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of ways to look at it. One, one proposal for that covers a number of different efforts. Then you're potentially putting all your uh, uh, request into one proposal and then, you know, ho uh, hoping that it competes well. Uh, you could also break it apart into smaller uh, actionable pieces to diversify your chances, maybe uh, get it down to the lower funding level. So where we're probably going to be giving out a few more grants than the larger ones. Uh, so it really depends on how coordinated we're going to see it look like in the proposal. Is it one well-developed plan or does it just look like a menu of uh, five different things that got uh, uh, culled together? So, you know, the reviewers are going to ha have to weigh uh, how coordinated the effort looks like, but certainly both themes would be uh, available. And then also, thank you for that, Eddie. And then also in the chat, um, we have sample actions. Is there an example of a type of project that you could give? Uh, not really. And uh, we are, this is a good time to mention the frequently asked questions document. Uh, all, all these questions are going to uh, get generalized into our frequently asked uh, questions document that we're currently finalizing that will go up on the grants landing page that I'll mention uh, further down. But uh, basically, really, the only guidance we can give is going to be related to eligibility uh, and you know, the parameters around uh, what would constitute a, a project that we could consider. So if it's in the watershed, uh, if it's from an eligible organization, if it's addressing one of those two themes, and it's a project that could be accomplished within the uh, funding level and the time frame that we're proposing, that's really uh, the most that we will be able to validate um, or that you could validate on our behalf. Uh, everything else is um, need, will be need to be left to the review process. Uh, so, you know, we really can only speak to eligibility and not to the competitiveness of these project ideas. I'll just add that um, this is a new effort for our office. We, although 
have been up and running for over 20 years as a community assistance program and have in the past done a process for projects to come in and be considered for funding. This is the first time our office has done it through the formal process through grants.gov. So we're learning just as you know, partners are learning. And this is meant to be the start of an annual grant offering. So that's something else to just frame and, and make sure everyone understands. Um, and to say that we don't know what the needs are until the applications come in. And so we are hoping that, that it really does give us a sense of what the opportunities and needs are across all you know six states and DC. And, um, and so as Eddie said, while we won't be able to sort of help frame projects to be more competitive, um, we're trying to, to, through those themes and through the example actions, help get a sense of the sorts of and types of projects. And then as Eddie goes through the slides, there's going to be a section on um, the criteria. And that also will help applicants um, see the types of projects. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, one of the things I forgot to mention, uh, particularly with the second theme is uh, I went to a conference a while back that, and I picked up two really key um, quotes that have been framing my thinking about our ability to impact, provide impact. One of them is uh, uh, a quote that says, nothing about us without us. So we, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know about these community needs. We need you to let us know. Uh, we don't want to come in and be prescriptive. We want you to be responsive. Uh, to what you're letting us know. So nothing about us without us. You are the us. Um, and the other uh, quote is, the solutions to community challenges are in the community. Uh, again, you are the ones that know best about what your needs are and what um, uh, how to help address them. So we need you to let us know. So that um, leads into then award information. Let's talk some money real quick. Uh, um, again, a million dollar cap, uh, about a million dollar cap for this round of funding. We are looking for awards to start uh, uh, sometime in the summer of 2023. The exact timing will depend on uh, how the review process shapes up and all the different approvals that we'll have to go through. Uh, it's not listed here, but I do wanna add that we are looking for periods of performance of about one to two years. So starting in that, uh, uh, from the award period on, um, uh, we're, we'll, we're hoping that most of the work can get done in the one to two year time frame. And again, within the funding levels, uh, it's going to be one application. So you'll be grouped based on the amount that you're applying. I know there's a little gap between 50 and 51. It should be 25 to 50 in reality, 50 plus to 150. But uh, you know, so we just generalized it. Uh, but once you submit, uh, we'll be reviewing the grants and I'll go through the review process uh, further down. But um, we do expect uh, a, more of the smaller grants than the larger grants just to uh, make sure that we have some pretty good distribution. And then also to highlight that there is no cost share required. So remember whatever budget you're looking for, as long as it fits into that $150,000 cap, that is what you're gonna be requesting uh, to address your project idea. And finally, all these projects must take place in the watershed. We're really not gonna be able to consider anything outside the watershed. So those proposals will have to uh, be declined at the start. Uh, if you are unsure where you reside, we do have a link to a county map uh, of the watershed so you can uh, look at where you're located and just uh, be sure that you are within the watershed. Next slide, please. All right, on eligible entities. A very diverse list, as I mentioned before. Hopefully everybody in the audience right now is already zeroing in on the category that uh, reflects their status. Uh, really, it's anybody but uh, federal agencies. Uh, I do wanna highlight that federal uh, partners of federal agencies are eligible to apply, uh, but the proposals have to come from the federal partner, not the, the federal agency itself. And also all the projects must have a public purpose. Uh, 
uh, there's a distinction here when some projects might be um, on the preservation or conservation side that are meant more uh, to be held in trust, for example, without any sort of public component. Uh, those likely would not compete as well versus projects where there is a uh, public aspect defined in the project design. So please remember that all the projects must demonstrate a public benefit uh, and that um, they cannot be solely for the purpose of supporting the proposing entity themselves. Uh, and I, you know, another link to that county map as well, so that you can make sure that you are you fit within that criteria. All right, now on to some, uh, we're getting further into the weeds here, folks, and I apologize. But again, this is a summary. Everything is detailed out uh, with a lot more um, information within the application itself and on our web page. But uh, essentially, this is a standard list of the things that you'll be required to uh, provide. The standard form 424 is serves as a cover sheet to your application, and all of these things are online. So uh, I'll explain that in, in a uh, second. But once you log in and get into grants.gov where the application is, is housed, uh, it's a step-by-step -step process of going through each of these forms. So the 424, SF-424 is a cover sheet. The SF-424A, um, which will be likely the budget sheet that everyone uses uh, for this uh, these grants, but that's where you will uh, record your budget information. There's instructions on what kind of level of detail that you'll need to provide. There's also a project summary that you'll be submitting. For a lot of folks, they can they uh, develop their summary after they've put their proposal together so that they know what they're summarizing. But basically this gives us the snapshot of what you're looking to address. And this summary helps us in uh, promoting and, and really uh, 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 documenting the project ideas. The detailed budget itself will be the worksheet where uh, a lot more of your cost information uh, will be detailed out. And there'll be a place where indirect costs will be mentioned. Uh, these are your overhead rates, things that are looking at addressing some of your administrative costs. Those do need to be submitted uh, with documentation uh, for anyone that has a negotiated indirect cost, for anybody that does not the um, uh, minimum uh, default is 10% for that line item. And that'll be explained in the application. And then there's some assurances that organizations have to submit uh, that just uh, assure the federal government of certain factors related to you as an organization in order to make you eligible for federal funding. Uh, the next piece uh, is the project narrative, which really tells us everything that you want us to know about what you wanna accomplish. Uh, there may be additional uh, requirements that will be listed in the application that um, may be specific to certain types of project ideas, um, but those will be uh, determined during the application process. Next slide. Eddie, before yes. we get into the narrative, can either you or Wendy speak a little bit more to public purpose and what that means? Sure, I can start. Uh, you know, I think... If, it's the connection to something external is how I, you know, I guess maybe an easy way to start looking at it that, um, uh, you know, an example that came to us was somebody had a need to conserve a, uh, a collection of artifacts that they had collected, but there was really no possibility that those, those artifacts were going to be made available to the public or put into public programming. Uh, so within the scope of that specific example, the need was to preserve these uh, and lock them in time, really for the benefit of the organization in that moment. A worthy need, something that you know should be addressed through some funding mechanism, but likely wouldn't be something that we would that would be competitive because there would be no public component in that example. Um, so it's looking at how what's the utility to the local community, to the visiting public, to uh, you know people beyond the. Uh, the organization itself. Thank you. Sure. All right, uh, let's dive in a little deeper then on the narrative. So again, this is what it, you, where you're gonna get an opportunity to let us know what you're really trying to do. Uh, what is the issue that you're trying to address? Uh, what kind of impact do you think will uh, result from investing in your project? 
Uh, and then, you know, how does this fit with the overall uh, organizational strategy that you're um, trying to advance for your organization or your collaboration? Uh, we are expecting a, a decent number of proposals. So in order to make the review process more efficient, we are limiting it to eight pages total with no more than 11 size font and one inch margins. This will include all texts, figures, and references. So anything that's topical to the idea that you're promoting will need to be covered in those eight pages. Um, I'll go into the specifics of the components in a second, but we are making allowances for the forms that you'll have to submit, uh, as well as some of the optional narrative uh, components that I'll mention in a second. Those will not be counted as part of the eight page limit. Also be mindful that we will only be reviewing what is contained within those eight pages and the ancillary forms that are requested. Uh, we aren't gonna be able to uh, take uh, PDFs or, pro or samples or any of those uh, extra materials that you might want us to see. So you'll need to make sure that um, everything that you want us to know is contained within those eight pages. Next slide, please. All right, the, nitty, the nuts and bolts of the actual uh, narrative itself. To start in a project overview, this is really setting the stage, letting us know what is the uh, issue at hand, uh, what is your perspective on the opportunities to address the issue, uh, and how does it fit within the landscape that you uh, have uh, connections to, the key tasks and milestones that you're looking to accomplish through the project. You know, really everything that explains uh, uh, what the need is and how you're looking to address the need. The second part is the strategic intent. So this is the connection to one of those two strategic themes or both if that's uh, how you're going, uh, uh, what you're looking to propose, but also the connection to equity, inclusion, accessibility, and engagement. We've been pretty clear that we wanna use these grants uh, to support efforts in these areas. So we wanna make sure we see that in what you're proposing. And then the innovation of the project intent. Uh, how does this fit with things that you've done in the past where we're making a strategic investment to get you to a next level uh, or really to reach a new audience or reach them in a new way uh, that hasn't been possible before? Uh, the third section, organization and applicant overview. This is where you get a chance to tell us about you as an organization, uh, your mission, how this fits in with what you're trying to do as an organization, uh, but also who's gonna be working on these projects and any partners that you might be recruiting to assist you. The optional piece uh, at the end is the project resumes and, and the letters of support. Again, those won't count to, towards your eight page limit. Uh, we do have limits for uh, both of the, the resumes and the letters of support, uh, but they are counted outside of your eight page. Uh, and those are really meant to uh, highlight the team itself and then the partners that you've recruited. You won't get counted against you if you don't include them, but you know because the reviewers are only going to have what they have in front of them to go by, if there's an opportunity to add more information, this is one of those opportunities to give us more. Next slide, please. All right, let's get into a little bit, uh, start talking about review and priority. Now, uh, again, I, we can't uh, advise on specific projects, but you know, we can say that in looking at the projects, we're gonna be looking at proposals that elevate a scope or audience of an existing program. Where are you suggesting to go to the next level? Also projects that expand the programming to address barriers that have kept, uh, that have been barriers for engagement in the past. Again, because you are the ones that have the best view of some of these barriers, we're relying on you to let us know what is the best way to address those barriers. And then proposals that kick off a new effort, strategy, or, or innovative design. We wanna be catalytic. Uh, we wanna make investments and we wanna know where there's gonna be some return for those investments. We are encouraging partnerships through this, uh, mainly to expand the number of folks working on these projects, but also to uh, have an ability to uh, aggregate resources, but also uh, exponentially expand the amount of impact that can be made. Uh, final selections not will not only take into consideration the review comments, but also will uh, look at the geographic distribution of the proposals received, 
the diversity of the types of awardees of, uh, that uh, we're considering and the themes that uh, those projects represent. I will point out that these projects are not designed to support annual maintenance and operations. So we really want to know, uh, be focused on the impact of some of these and then backtrack that to the kinds of projects that will uh, help you achieve those impacts. Next slide. All right, now uh, move into the, the specific review criteria. There are five that the review panel are gonna be utilizing. Uh, I do list them here with the weighting factors. So you can see uh, how we're viewing the scale of each of these components. Uh, and I'll go through each of the five uh, individually. Next slide, please. They're all gonna be rated on a zero to 10 scale. So the first one is the connection to Chesapeake Gateway strategic themes. You know, here it's uh, looking because the gate, uh, Chesapeake Gateways represents such a great variety of treasured resources and stories. Uh, we want to be able to capture that uh, uh, through the proposals within the frame of one of the two strategic themes. You know, between interpretive initiatives and resilient communities, there's a lot uh, that can be covered in those two themes. So we're really excited that. Uh, we have those two themes as a frame for the proposals. Next slide. I've highlighted it, but uh, it's point. It's uh, uh, helpful to point it out again. The the connection to equity, inclusion, accessibility, and engagement is going to be very important. These are investments. We are looking for return on these investments, and this is an area where we hope to make uh, some really key impact for the watershed. So the proposal's ability to reflect the network of people, places, and programs and stories housed within the watershed that help in, uh, the citizens and the visitors enjoy, learn about, and conserve the watershed all fit within this criteria. The reviewers will be looking at how well the proposals address equity, inclusion, accessibility, and uh, engagement. Do these projects build long-term relationships with underrepresented communities? How is the intended audience engaged in these projects? So those will be some of the questions that fall within this review category. Next, please. Moving down to innovation of project intent. This is, starts to look more at that investment uh, angle where we want to be catalytic in these investments uh, and create um, an opportunity to really take things to the next level. So projects that show some sort of innovative design, innovative way of engaging a community, innovative way of addressing an issue. And honestly, it's gonna be for you to define the innovation for us uh, because you're the one that's letting us know how this takes uh, what you've already been done to the next level. So the reviewers are gonna look at how well that innovation is described and how well that they can make determinations on um, how it compares to what you've done in the past. Next slide. And the next one is clarity of the project's operational plan. There's gonna be a lot of good ideas, but we, we really want these projects to be successful for your benefit, for the benefit of the communities that you wanna impact. But also, as Wendy said, this is a new program for us. So we have to be very careful that we are making investments that are gonna bear fruit. Uh, we want some clarity in the outcomes that you're proposing. We wanna know that the design that you've planned out will, uh, if done, if conducted through our support, will lead you to those outcomes. So the reviewers are gonna be looking at the budget, the project narrative, you, how uh, are those outcomes conveyed in what you're proposing? Next slide. And then your uh, team's ability to accomplish the project. Again, we want everybody to be successful. Uh, we wanna have these network grants support organizations that are trying uh, to do the next great thing uh, to really get to the next level of support. So you know, it's gonna be very important that what you're proposing fits within your capacity and that that's reflected within the proposal. So we're gonna, the reviewers are gonna be looking at uh, is the team that's assembled carry the correct skills to accomplish what's being proposed? Uh, do you have the right subject matter experts uh, that you'll be coordinating? Uh, do you demonstrate an ability to meet the administrative uh, grant requirements that are listed in the application? Next slide, please. 
So Eddie, why don't we just pause for a minute? That was a lot of information and just kind of get caught up in the chat. We've been answering questions as they're coming in. Great. If anybody has a question now, feel free to raise your hand or pop it into the chat. We'll just take a moment to um, let Eddie take a breath <laughs> and, and see if anything's percolating in people's brains. So we have one, if awarded, will typical federal funding components be required? NEPA, Davis Beacon wages, et cetera. Yes. Yes, through the award process, all, there, there'll be a whole next step where we will, uh, in developing those award letters, everything will be housed in there of all the re additional requirements that the specific project ideas will require. I'm just backtracking here and see if there's others. Uh, yes, friends groups are eligible uh, as long as they're a, a documented uh, nonprofit. And as long as the project isn't, you know, primarily a direct benefit to the federal agency. And then. I, uh, I kind of messed up in, in trying to answer Ava's question about the, whether the services or programs need to be provided at no cost. So the answer has now been shared with everybody. But but for a quick example, uh, in the past, we had a cooperator that, that uh, came to understand if they offered programs for free, lots of people signed up and then not many, many of them necessarily showed up. To the, to the time slot that they had reserved. So they learned that it was better to actually charge some, some nominal fee for something. Uh, even if it was five or $10, it, it uh, uh, motivated people actually to keep the, keep the date that they'd made. And then that $10 was, was applied to the rental costs for the kayaks that people were using for the on-water program. Just, just as a one example of how program uh, income can roll through in advancement of the of the project itself, which is what it is is supposed to do. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Bob. All right, and, Eddie. I think we can continue on. on. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and just so you know that, that there'll be multiple steps uh, once we get the review into the reward uh, award process, where a lot of these things uh, will come up again as we finalize what the award is actually going to cover and what the requirements are uh, specific to each project that gets awarded. So there'll be a whole other step of advisement uh, when we get to the award phase. Uh, but to get, before we can get to the award phase, we have to get through the selection process. So I just summarized it here uh, for your benefit so you know uh, what to expect after you've applied. The first step is going to be an initial review where we're going to be looking at the very basic elements of eligibility. Have all the forms been uh, submitted? Uh, have all the components been uh, submitted? And is the, that doc, can we document that strategic connection? Uh, so that we can move uh, the projects that do meet all of those uh, elements forward to the review committee. Uh, from there, uh, those projects that advance will go to an external review committee uh, that'll utilize the review criteria we walked through to uh, rate each of the proposals and come up with a recommended slate of projects that are uh, worthy of funding. Uh, those then uh, get forwarded to Wendy as the uh, MPS uh, superintendent of our office uh, to look at things like the geographic distribution, diversity of awardees, thematic distribution, and uh, compare all that to the actual, uh, the finalized funds that we will have available uh, for uh, the total uh, number of grants that we can give out. So within all of that, then uh, a slate gets uh, uh, compiled and forwarded to the regional office where then there's, there'll be multiple approvals that happen within uh, park service channels on any sort of federal award. Uh, after that process is completed, that uh, leads us into an award process. And that's where we'll, uh, there'll likely be uh, some more engagement with uh, the selected applicants on finalizing any questions that come, that come up before that award letter is final. Next slide. So our timeline for all of this, we're in the application period now. We announced last week. So the grant is live on grants.gov. 
Uh, we also have a link to it on our landing page that I'll mention in a second. Uh, I highlighted that we have a pretty lengthy application process, so a deadline of January 30th to give you plenty of time to organize your thoughts, really uh, uh, organize any collaborations you might want, and put some ideas together that you want to advance into a proposal. Uh, from there, we'll go uh, into the review process uh, in through the spring and then leading into the award notification process in uh, uh, early summer with uh, awards and periods of performance starting in late summer. Notes. Uh, so I think this is a, uh, also a good time to mention because of that lengthy award period, uh, I, I highlighted it earlier, but we're really not in a, a, a position to uh, provide advising on project specific ideas. So hopefully today's presentation, the sample actions and activities that we have listed in the application uh, uh, can help guide you in, in your thoughts on what a project might be. Uh, we do have some general answers in our FAQ that you'll see that you'll be able to rely on as well. We do have another uh, uh, like 2.0 of today's presentation that will look more at the application submission process. So we'll go through uh, the grants.gov link. Uh, we'll do a, a quick walkthrough of the landing grants landing page and also explain in more detail some of the pre-requirements that you'll have before submitting a proposal. Uh, so those workshops are listed here. Uh, you can, the, it's going to be repeated. So just like this one and the one we did on Tuesday, you're welcome to sign up for both, uh, but it's going to be the same presentation. Uh, you will need to register for both though to get the, um, register, the Zoom link. And if you want to go back to anything that we've recorded in the past, including this webinar, everything will get uploaded to our YouTube playlist by hopefully the end of tomorrow. Uh, so definitely check out the YouTube page. Uh, next slide, please. If uh, I mentioned the grant is live, so you can go in there now to grants.gov and uh, you know start looking at the application components and the things that you might need to do to, to get yourself organized. Uh, but before you do that, if you haven't submitted for a federal grant before, uh, the first step you need to do is get registered with the System for Award Management. Uh, this is a, a, a website that everybody that is looking to get federal funds has to register uh, and be logged in. Uh, part of that registration process gives you a unique identity identifier. Uh, so this is a number that you will utilize uh, when you're making the application and everything related to your proposal uh, through the award process will uh, be tied to this UEI. Um, for those that are familiar with the system, this replaces the old DUNS number. Uh, if you don't know what a DUNS number is, don't worry about it. Um, uh, the UEI is now the number uh, that, that the federal government is using. I also want to highlight that there is no cost to doing this. Uh, sometimes you'll end up on a mailing list of folks that are third-party vendors that are trying to solicit you to pay them to do this process for you. Uh, you know, I can't tell you no, because, you know, these are uh, um, uh, avenues that you're free to explore, but just know that you do not need to pay any fees to sign up with SAM and get that UEI. Uh, if you need help navigating it, there's uh, um, toolkits on the SAM.gov website. There's, uh, uh, in YouTube, there's instructional videos you can access. So plenty of places you can go to get assistance, but, uh, you know, just be careful of folks that offer an ability to do it for you for a fee. I also wanted, uh, we did clarify this question came up in Tuesday's webinar. For anybody that's proposing a project that's going to involve sub uh, assignments or, or sub partners, uh, where you will be then divvying up the money to uh, either uh, uh, other program providers uh, or uh, um, uh, other partners, they will all need to be registered in SAM as well if they're going to uh, be uh, in the chain of disbursements on your end. Next slide.
So what we've been talking about today is the network grants, but this is these uh, conversations are part of a larger series of conversations where we're now engaging the network more broadly, uh, the Gateways Network. We've done a series of other listening sessions and introductions to our strategic plan. Uh, uh, I mentioned our next uh, uh, event in this series is the grant writing workshop. And then we also have a webinar in December that uh, dives deeper into a concept of uh, gateway community. So this is looking at uh, the impact that communities can make by organizing themselves at uh, a community level uh, outside of uh, this funding opportunity. This is uh, you know, conversations that talk about uh, impact uh, across the, the network at a community level um, beyond uh, the grants. And then after the application deadline, at some point in 2023, we will also be hosting uh, a Gateways Network annual conference. Uh, and this is gonna be our first chance to really gather everybody, uh, start identifying some best practices and some models that we wanna put forward from some of our past 25 years of support, of supporting the, the Chesapeake uh, Gateways Network. Next slide. All of those can be found, recordings for all the ones we've done in the past can be found on our website. Uh, this is a screenshot of the main page. Uh, the link is at the top. Uh, so feel free to go on there. Uh, again, it'll have a lot of the information you've heard today, but it, with a lot more detail. There's also a link to the YouTube channel, as well as the actual application on grants.gov. Uh, and we're also very shortly going to be adding uh, a link to the frequently asked questions as well. Uh, so definitely take a, uh, some time to look at both this resource and the uh, actual grant application itself. And finally, if uh, anybody has questions that didn't come up today or that you think about after you've uh, looked through the material a little bit more, uh, send an email to chesapeakegrants at mps.gov. Uh, that's the email we're using to uh, document all the questions that are coming in so we can add them to the FAQ. Uh, and I also you know, wanted to close with giving you that um, website link as well. And uh, we hope everybody will join us in November for the next series of uh, actually diving into the submitting an application process. That is all I had. Uh, I will turn it back over to uh, Wendy to close us out. Thanks, Eddie. I guess I'll first, you know, just open it to, we have, um, you know, some time left here. I'll just open it to, our partners and friends and that have joined, if there are other questions, we can come, yep, there, we can come on. Um, we've got a little time, happy to, to hear more questions. And feel free to raise your hand and we can come off mute. Just curious, uh, oh. Should I have raised my hand? It's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I was just curious. Uh, in Baltimore City, we've been thinking about or exploring kind of some ecotourism opportunities and how that could uh, be a climate or environmental literacy kind of like project. Um, and I know you can't provide specific feedback on like specific types of project, but would, just does that feel like it would be in alignment with um, the goals? Um, in the the, um, the the themes of the funding, <laughs> it's such a hard place that we're in because it's it's so different than the way our office has functioned for all these years. Because we, we've in the past been able to just openly brainstorm with partners and and have these really collaborative conversations. And and so I hope you understand that we're in this this new construct where we can't necessarily talk about specific projects. So, so if we zoom out from Baltimore and, and talk about, are there projects that would relate to this, a way to connect people to stewardship and environmental education and do that through ecotourism? Do, you know, would that line up with the resilient communities theme and category? You know, yeah, I think it probably would, right? Um, there, there might even be opportunities to pull in the inclusive storytelling by being, you know, sort of thoughtful and clever about 
ecotourism of what you know and 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 how you're positioning those um experiences and who's providing the experience and uh, who are the experiences being offered to um so you know maybe that's one way to to try to answer these questions that are um sort of location specific is to sort of zoom out and say how a project like that anywhere in the watershed um could be a fit for the funding and uh, just one last question would it be appropriate for different um jurisdictions or municipalities or states for that matter in the watershed to collaborate to to focus on a project that's like that has a larger geographic footprint mm. yeah i you know, there's a um, there's there's a statement in the grant announcement that says that the network is based on partnerships and that that we support and encourage partnerships. So the concept of collaboration of either across jurisdictions or within a community of multiple partners within a community, I think is um, is is a great thing. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that you know, there, there's going to need to be a sense of realism in in these collaborations. That is, you know, it, it it it's what's practical within the funding level that we're talking about. So, uh, you know, definitely wanting those collaborations to be well defined and have a a, a really good uh, scope that fits within that funding level. I think, but other than that, as Wendy said, yeah, partnerships and collaborations are something we're going to be looking out for. Um, I also wanted to go back to your original question. I think the easiest way that we're going to be able to answer these kinds of questions is turn those two strategic themes into, uh, you know, does my idea promote, you know, one of the, the bullets that was in each of those themes? If you answer yes to any of them, you know, I think you could be confident to move that idea forward into a proposal. With the idea of the collaborating with other partners, just remember there will need to be a a single applicant. You know, so there needs to be a lead applicant. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So as we close um, for this evening, and, and thank you, Eddie, for, for walking through everything, and, and um, Bob and Rebecca and, and Brent, thank you for helping you know, answer questions in the chat and, and help manage um, this evening. I just want to close by saying we are just really excited to build on 20 years of success and experience um, and support that our office been, has been able to bring out across the watershed and really to advance the concept of Chesapeake Gateways to more of a, a broad geographic area, um, you know, truly trying to get out um, up the watershed, so to speak, um, and also advancing our new strategic um, plan. So, we will um, be sure to actually I'll put it um, right in the chat before we close so people have the strategic plan and, and can take a look at that. Um, and we've placed in the chat multiple times the link to the landing page for um, for the grant for from Chesapeake Gateways. There's a lot of really good information in there. Take some time to read the introduction. It frames how we're trying to really bring forward a bold new approach to be inclusive, to advance our original legislation in ways that connect people to the Chesapeake and, um, and take some time to talk with partners across your communities and across your watershed uh, about this opportunity. If it's not a fit for your organization, help get the word out. Um, because this is the first time and we are looking for this to be an annual offering, um, it's helpful that the first year we really see a, a positive application um, and, a, and a, a lot of interest in so that we can understand the needs and opportunities that are out there. 
So thank you for your time. Um, and uh, I will just real quick try to, oh, Bob, please. Yeah, just, just one thing because uh, um, with the strategic planning plan going out and we and we do encourage you all to, to look at that, but I just wanna make this distinction. It's going to address four strategic themes and understand that those will be the focus of the Chesapeake Gateways program for, for you know several years to come. This grant solicitation is focused on only two of those in order just to uh, you know sharpen the focus of the grant award. So just understand there's there is that distinction. Don't don't let it confuse you. We're focused on the two, the two for the grant program. A question had come up in, in the chat about that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you okay. for clarifying that. And and we will remember that slide I had that had the different boxes um, of how we're deploying the um, appropriations that we get for gateways. Those two other themes in the strategic plan we are moving forward on and and looking to support through some of the other ways that we're bringing. Um, both technical assistance and cooperative and, and interagency partnerships forward. So um, be sure that we're we're trying to work on all four of our strategic themes from our five-year st strategic plan. Um, but like Bob said, this grant offering is focused on the two themes that inclusive storytelling and um, resilient communities. All right. Well, um, I, I hope everyone um, has a nice evening and thank you for sitting through with us. Um, hope to see lots of neat ideas and applications come through and we hope to um, have you join us at one of the, the two sessions in November about um, the process of applying. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.